to superpowers and everything in between. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sex, Love, and Superpowers podcast show. I am your host, Tatiana Berende, and today my guest is Cindy Kennedy, and we are going to be talking about sex and chronic illness. Let me tell you a little bit about Cindy before we dive into our conversation today. Cindy Kennedy is a nurse practitioner and has worked in women's health for over 21 years. She practiced gynecology and has cared for thousands of patients ranging in age from 15 all the way to 99. Unbeknownst to her, several years ago, she contracted Lyme's disease. Her symptoms were subtle at first, and then in 2011, her disease struck with a vengeance. Even as a knowledgeable healthcare professional, the struggles to find a cause became overwhelming. She came to feel the same sinking feeling that other Lyme sufferers must bear, the endless walk down the frightening path of misdiagnoses, shattered hope, and disappointment. With the love and support of her husband and three daughters, Cindy has made great strides in improving her health, though she is still reminded that she has lasting effects from the illness. She's passionate about providing education about Lyme disease, co-infections, treatment options, and most importantly, living with Lyme. Her podcast, Living with Lyme, has offered expert advice from many sought-after practitioners and researchers. Her compassion and education has given her the opportunity to open her own practice to find upstream reasons for chronic issues. She works alongside of her daughter, Kara, who is a functional registered dietitian with the same focus on care. The Pursue Wellness Center is slated to open spring of 2020. It will offer an integrative approach to health and treatment modalities to assist in detoxification, cellular support, meditation, parasympathetic support, and a therapeutic yoga center. Welcome to the show, Cindy. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And that was a great introduction. I can't wait to go to the center. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it sounds great. (laughs) Um, Before we jump in here, will you tell our listeners what your superpowers are? I had to think about this. Uh, I think that I'm fortunate enough that I just go about, it's myself. My superpower is definitely humor. It, it takes on a lot of different forms. Um, it's also part of being compassionate, sometimes just making the situation light when that person across the table from you is struggling Mm -hmm. and just breaking that up a little bit with, you know, some silly face or some silly little words. I really feel that that is the biggest gift that God has given me. And it's, it's just that giggle. It's wonderful. I think humor really is a superpower and and is greatly healing. I I remember hearing a story years ago about a man who was diagnosed with cancer and decided that he was just going to, he was given like three months or something. He said he was just going to rent the funniest movies that he could find and just spend the rest of his days on the couch with his family laughing. And um, he ended up curing himself from cancer with just <laughs> laughter. Great, you know? it's great. Like, that positive, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know that everyone would have the same outcome, but, you know, and that wasn't what he was necessarily going for. He thought he was dying, but he, there was something in the surrender and in, in the joy. I think it's a really, a really health-giving thing, that laughter. It is, it is. And, you know, trying to use it appropriately. I've, put my foot in my mouth just a couple times. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's part of it. it is. Well, I think, I think humor is really a skill, you know, and I think we, we do have to shove our foot in there a few times to get what's going to, what's going to land well. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, especially when someone looks at you and all you want to go and say is, Oh, but a boom, but a bang. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I was really intrigued to have you on the show because this is a topic that I haven't covered at all. You know, most of, most of this show is for um, people who either have an engaging sex life or who, you know, are struggling, but more for emotional or communication reasons. Um, 
And so I was really curious to talk about, you know, what living with chronic illness and, and, and having a sexual life was like. Um, so I guess I would just love to hear, you know, we only have a few minutes before we have to go to a break. Um, so I'm trying to figure out like, what's the, what's the best way to, to dive into this conversation? Because I, I, I know it's going to be deep and I, and I don't want to just like cut us off in the middle of something really important. Um, maybe you could start out by telling us a little bit about your journey with limes and, and, um, and what were some of the most surprising elements to you in, in contracting this, this chronic illness? Well, I guess um, half the problem is finding that diagnosis because the whole time you're feeling awful. And it's kind of like Groundhog Day where you wake up and you think, oh, maybe tomorrow will be better. And it's exactly the same as the day before. And so, you know, there's always that struggle personally, and it really does change your personality. And for some people, it's a struggle neurologically. And is a disconnect because Lyme can certainly affect the brain. And when you have that disconnect, it's, it's hard. Uh, you can't even figure out, you know, sometimes if you're coming or going, and then you're looking at your partner or your spouse. And, you know, I mean, some people can hold their own for quite a while. And then there are others that are like, okay, well, when, when are you going to feel better because, you know, you're crabby and you're, you know, you're, you're distant and, and things like that because you're constantly focusing on how awful you feel. So, you know, when you have somebody that has a cold or, you know, a belly bug or something, you know that they're going to get better. Right. You know, there's an end period point. of time, mm -hmm. you know, but when you're <clears throat> struggling and the fatigue is incredible, and you're sleeping so much, it's very difficult for your, you know, your sex partner to kind of figure out, like, when to approach you for this. And, and I will tell you, there's a huge loss for uh, people who suffer from Lyme for their own personal well-being, as well as their support systems, people just kind of walk away. And they walk away because they probably don't know what to do. Um, they also walk away because they think you're crazy. You know, we're all just like one insect bite away from a psychiatric diagnosis because we pretty much look well, but we aren't well. Yeah, I've heard about, especially... Um I mean, this is kind of going in a different direction, but um, I know I've, I've read some articles about, especially when women go into a doctor's office complaining of symptoms, it can be really hard to even get the testing done because there's more assumption that women are creating things psychosomatically um, and kind of in the medical field that there's this like, you know, the, the hysteria of, of times gone by is still present in the medical psyche in terms of how we treat patients. And, and, um, and I've definitely seen that with Lyme's. I mean, Lyme's is huge in New England where you live and where I used to live. Um, it's a huge, it's almost like an epidemic issue at this point. Um, oh, it, it, it's a pandemic, but here it's, incredible. And mainstream medicine does not get it. They're, they're narrow-minded. They think it is a bacteria that a round of antibiotics will take care of. And they also think that the standard two-tier testing is perfect, but it is not. It's not specific enough. It's not sensitive enough. So people will go along their path after their doctor has said, well, your tests are negative, uh, and they're unaware, you know, both these physicians, uh, medical providers, as well as these poor patients, that these tests are not accurate. And so that's where that big gap is. Mm -hmm. um, so we do, like I said, we do need to go to a quick break, but I really do want to dive into sort of navigating um, 
navigating sexuality and, and romantic and intimate partnership while living with chronic illness when we get back. Before we go to break, will you tell our listeners where they can go to find out more about you and your wellness center and your podcast and all that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You can find us uh, at www.pursue wellness.us. The wellness center is slated to open in East Longmeadow, Massachusetts come spring of 2020. My own podcast is uh, located on every place you get your podcast, but website is www.livingwithlime.us. Lots of resources, how to test a tick uh, not yourself, but where to send it. Um, and, and you know, it, it's valuable because people who are looking for information can go to one place. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we're talking with Cindy Kennedy about sex and chronic illness. More when we get back. Stay tuned. Hello, everyone. This is Tonya Don Reckla, Executive Director of Superpower Experts. And we want to thank each of you for making Superpower Up the number one podcast network for personal development and spiritual growth. Because people like you have the courage to say that mindfulness, healthy living, disrupting reality, the pursuit of consciousness, responsible entrepreneurship, and radical parenting matter. We now amass over 1 million downloads monthly in more than 90 countries. Our numbers keep growing because there are far more people willing to live divergently than mass media wants to acknowledge. For you, the change makers, the light bearers, the way showers, we say thank you. If you're ready to take the next step in your evolution, go now to superpowerexperts.com and take the superpower quiz. And as Neva Lee Rekla, our youngest podcaster, likes to remind us, remember, we all have superpowers and we can change the world. All right, we're back. So um, before the break, you were talking a little bit about, you know, your partner sort of not knowing how to approach you, your support system and friends kind of falling by the wayside. What was it like for you and what have you seen in other people that you've worked with um, in terms of being able to communicate about what's happening and find some sort of happy medium? Because, I mean, intimacy and partnership, whether you're actually engaging full on sexually all the time or not is, is a really key component to having a a healthy marriage, a healthy, intimate relationship with your partner. Well, number one, when you are dealing with any chronic disease, your body is caught in that sympathetic Phase. And so hormonally, throughout your whole body, you're constantly being chased and running away from that saber-toothed tiger. So, 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 so for the listeners who maybe don't know what the sympathetic okay. phase is, you, Cindy's talking about the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight response yes. that Thank some of you. us are, are familiar with. Yeah, that's important to know. And, you know, in terms of my my practice now, I try to teach people how to get back over to the parasympathetic, mm-hmm. which is your rest and digest. So, you know, considering that you've got fatigue, you've got some people have pain, some people have uh, just that chronicity and that mental strain and hormones are all off too. You may very well not have that sex drive that you had before, or you can't even think about that because your, your mind, even your body is in a completely different place. I think about it now and know coming from that, that part in my mind, I continued and had sex and whatnot, but you go and talk to my husband and he's like rolling his eyes. He goes, are you <laughs> kidding me? Are you kidding me? Well, in my mind, I was just fabulous. You know, I was just, <laughs> I was great. I could put it all aside, but I probably wasn't like that. And, you know, who do you talk to about this? You right. know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And, So, you know, plugging through, realizing that this is certainly a concern because, you know, I, it was brought to my attention and I'm like, oh boy, I bet you a lot of women, you know, including men as well, probably have this issue. And especially with Lyme disease, uh, in terms of men, uh, 
I have one of my podcast guests that told me that impotence, you know, not being mm. able to achieve uh, an erection was one of his first signs. He was a very, mm. uh, you know, robust young man. And, you know, that can be a part. But I think beyond anything, it's learning how to communicate, to talk. If it's the elephant in the room, and nobody's talking about it, then people become resentful and unhappy and whatnot. Even, you know, it's, it's, it's a method. It, it's just the way you are. And, and focusing on a relationship is about communication. And if you can't communicate, Absolutely. yeah, it's, it's saying, hey, you know, gosh, you know, you don't feel good. How can I help you? You know, it's always nicer to hop in, you know, a little love session with someone who's being nice to you mm -hmm. than someone who's kind of ignoring you or just, you or know. Or is like, when are you going to get better already? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, learning both sides of it, being aware that you're not quite, a, you know, kind of feeling romantic because, you know, you're caught up in this illness, no matter what the illness is. Uh, you know, you think about people outside of the Lyme world that end up with surgery, you know, women with breast cancer, and all of a sudden their feministic breasts are, are now gone and trying to deal with body image or someone who had a colon uh, removed for whatever reason, and now they have a colostomy bag. And, you know, how, that's like the new me. And it's like, oh, God, no one's going to even think I'm sexy, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it's, it's about all of that and being able to say how you do feel, how you don't feel, and even what will help you, you know? Like, oh, my God, if you what could just give things? me a... Yeah. What are the things that you found would be help, were helpful for you? Right. For me is the help that I got. I once went to a conference on a, uh, a sex therapist and when she was introduced, uh, she got up to the microphone, she kind of grabbed the microphone real sexy. And she said, you know what turns me on? And everybody is like, Oh God, what is she going to say? Is what my husband has done for me in the last 24 years. Oh my God, he gets down and scrubs the floor. I'm pulling my <laughs> clothes off. <laughs> so, so thinking of that, right? You're thinking about, you know, if you're not well and no one is helping, the laundry's piling up, there's no food in the refrigerator, you know, your mind is so crazy, you can't figure out how to put your prescriptions and your supplements together. Without that, there's just, you've got to be able to help. You know, you've got to have that help. So I, I think that's, that's the big win on my part is that uh, my husband and I can talk about it mm -hmm. and we laugh a little bit about it right now. But I think that being sick over a long period of time can really take a toll. And I know it does take a toll on relationships. So Absolutely. I mean, that's yeah. like, because the partner then has to pick up all of this slack that they weren't having to do before. I mean, I'm seeing that even just now. I'm not chronically ill. I'm pregnant. But there's, but there are certain <laughs> things where it's like, I, I actually can't do a whole set of dishes because my, the way that our sink is designed, like my belly is so big at this point, like I can't really stand there and reach the faucet at, effectively, you know? And so my husband has to do the dishes all the time and, and like there, there are certain things, you know, and, and we know because we know that pregnancy is not a permanent condition, right? So it's like, okay, like if we, I can, I can sort of brace myself for, for this temporary taking on of extra tasks that I'm not used to, to taking on all by myself. But with chronic illness, I mean, you don't know when or if it's ever going to end. Right, right. And, and again, being that there's such a hormonal change, you know, some women who are younger, and they're not, uh, they may not be getting regular cycles. And so you kind of get stuck there and you may not, I mean, uh, in terms of gynecology, you know, you, you, we're all in, when we're having regular periods and we're in that reproductive zone, we have that increase of testosterone around the time of ovulation because 
that's what we're supposed to do. That's right. when we're supposed to have sex so we can make babies and procreate. And then there happens to be a little surge with the period. But when people are kind of flat, there is no change. There is no surge. And your body goes into its own survival mode. And so just getting to the bathroom can be a big deal. Just, you know, pulling together something to eat can be a big deal. So it, it turns out to be last on the list. So how did you get yourself out of that? And how have, what have you seen that has been really effective with other people that you've worked with or talked to about this? I think one of the biggest things, and I, I talk a little bit about this, and I put together a program um, it's called Finding Your Inner Goddess. And, you know, by by someone just broaching the subject and giving someone a little bit of a platform to talk about what is going on, and then very simplistically, when you go home and you're having a conversation, ask. Ask about their feelings. What in an, you know, either sex, whoever is the one that's sick is going to ask the well person, what are they feeling? Tell me about how, how it is that you know you're surviving this. And I encourage things like some laughter, it's very hard. I also encourage the words, thank you. Nothing is better than mm -hmm. feeling that someone really cares. And what they're doing is is highly needed. And so it's acknowledged. thank you. Yeah. It's acknowledged. Yes, uh, please and thank you. I just it just goes a long way. Isn't that what you teach your children? Right, right. Well, things we learned in kindergarten. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, just giving giving people the ability to talk about it and giving them some suggestions. Sometimes that's kind of all they need. My husband and I uh, have been uh, presenting at conferences in the area on um, surviving Lyme disease as a couple, but you can take the Lyme disease out of it. It can be universal. For chronic so, illness, for, sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, Lyme disease, I think, kind of like encapsulates all of the symptoms of the most common chronic illnesses in, in one, right? Right, right. And especially, you know, because it's difficult to get that diagnosis, you know, less than less than 50% ever have that bullseye, which is typical for Lyme, but it's very, I shouldn't even say typical because it's very untypical. But um, a lot of times people had no, have no idea. So if you can get it real quick and get those antibiotics, you're going to probably be in good shape. But because it doesn't happen for a lot of people, this long road is, is difficult. Yeah, I was very fortunate. I got the bullseye and I got the antibiotics right away. And um, Oh, good for you. So I have not struggled with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a nice intact you know, immune system you have. And I guess it really depends on the type of tick and where it is. And, you know, I mean, if it, if it, if you get a bite where the sun don't shine, you know, you're not, you're not going to find it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's tough because a lot of doctors don't believe in it. Why do you think that is? It's a, a, if you go really and you dive in into what the Center for Disease Control, the National Institute of Health, and you go back way long ago, there's a lot of political and bureaucratic things that have gone on. And for me, I don't like to take that role. I don't like to say, well, you know, and stir the pot because that was then, this is now my my knowledge, you know, unfortunately gains very per gain personally. My ability now is to continue to educate people, get on, you know, my soapbox and say, listen. And, you know, I think that's, that's a good place for me. Whereas there are people who are active politically trying to change laws in Massachusetts here just a couple of years back there was a law change saying that any Massachusetts insurance company, or I should say any company that provides insurance that are under the mandates of Massachusetts 
has to provide long-term antibiotic coverage for Lyme patients. Before that, at that 21-day mark, especially for intravenous, you know, the mm-hmm. insurance companies rah rah sis boom ba on day 27, day 28, radio silence. Mm-hmm. You are now in an experimental zone. You cannot have paid antibiotics anymore. So that that has changed, and that's a good thing. But you know, there there is a whole you know, it's a whole, uh, I want to say stories and Plum Island and crooked, uh, governmental, you know, people. And, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's like the only disease that, that has happened to everything else is, you know, straightforward. And you can also look at it from the aspect of it's antibiotics. So there's no big push for any pharmaceutical company to get involved because it's, you know, generic antibiotics. It's sad. Very sad. Hmm. What, I mean, you you said in your, in your bio that you're doing a lot better, right? You're, you've been able to live with it, you still sometimes have, have the effects of it, but what have you found to be sort of the most supportive in terms of coming out of this state of real acute chronic? Yeah, I'll tell you, because you are, you become toxic. So as you know, if you are, if you don't get it right away and, you know, deal with it at a local area and this becomes systemically uh, proliferative. It hides in tissues and whatnot. It can invade your heart. Uh, it can invade your brain. When I finally said I had enough with antibiotics and I kept learning more and learning more, I realized my detox pathways are horrible. So I was unaware at that time that I really needed to focus a lot on that. So when you say detox pathways, what do you mean? Yeah, you have to not only kill these bacteria, you have to be able to eliminate them out of your body. Mm-hmm. So you need to sweat, you need to poop. We talk a lot about poop in functional medicine, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, we do. And you need to know how to get those kidneys to flush things out as well. Mm-hmm. You also need the appropriate nutrition. Um, you need to make sure that your cellular mitochondria are functioning really well. And you need to know it. I mean, I usually treat people with um, a type of B vitamin uh, that is not just standard, it's a methylated B vitamin because about 45% of the population carry a variant to a gene called the MTHFR gene and they can't utilize regular. Folate. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the, the whole thing is taking this crazy approach to not just killing it. You've got to support all these pathways that help you heal. Mm-hmm. You've got to get the right sleep. You've got to try to move. You've got to try to lower the stress, that lifestyle. It's very, very important. And so learning all these things, this is how I became, you know, a functional medicine provider because the way it was offered to me before just killed the bugs is not right. We, we've got to do the whole thing. And so now, yeah, I mean, I know my limits, uh, a little bit more alcohol than, you know, maybe a drink here or there. Yeah, it can really make my body hurt. Uh, gluten is another thing that really aggravates me and sugar really aggravates me. But in general, listening to your body, following those cues and not pushing yourself to the point of breaking is really the way you have to protect your body. You have to heal it. And it does take a long time. So something that we've talked about on this show before is sort of the power of of sex to be a, a, to be a healing tool. And so um, of course because you know this is the topic of of our conversation today I'm I'm very curious about and and maybe you don't have direct personal experience with this but my mind immediately goes to creating a space where instead of dreading it instead of feeling like it's too much of an effort 
um, creating space for that to actually be another healing and cleansing pathway for things to move. That's actually, that's a good point. Cause, uh, cause I mean, I know I've moved a tremendous amount of energy. I move a lot of things through my body and through my system with sex. Um, and, and it, it's a it's a practice, but I think it's it might be you know it's just something to throw in the pot there of of how how we move how we move things through because there are there are fluids that move you know when when we're having sex and um, so yeah that's just that, that's something that that is definitely coming to me as we're having this conversation is is. And like I said, we've, you know, we talk about this on the show a lot about mindset when it comes to sexuality and how, you know, whether we're chronically ill or not, we can get into a space of I'm too tired, I have a headache, I don't feel like it, you know, um, and really just inviting in the possibility for that to be a healing practice. I think that is something that no one talks about. That is something that is very enlightening because you just brought it to my mind and you know you made me really think about this because we're always talking about yeah it's like sex is like going to the gym once you've been there you're like god i gotta come back to the gym more often Mm -hmm. but sometimes getting into that role um you know being as you are a mentor for women to allow themselves to be sexual. Mm -hmm. I think that that's what they need to hear, whether they're well or whether they're sick, whether they, you know, I mean, I dealt in gynecology with several women that were abused and their sexuality is in a bad place. It's hard for them to let that go. And then from a medical standpoint, the release of, of whatever's kind of, been down and deep in you or, you know, achieving an orgasm and releasing endorphins and things like that are are certainly a big positive. And that's something that I have not really thought about. And so you bringing that forward is going to give me something more to talk to people about. Very cool. Maybe a, a little addition to your functional medicine approach. <laughs> right, right, right. And the that le- power of sex. Yeah, yeah. I have to let people know me, you know, before I can bring this up because either they're going to really love the topic or they're going to really say this one's, she's crazy. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's far out. And that's why, I mean, even saying that I was going to do this show was like a huge edge for me, especially when I was living in New England, as you are. Um, because it's, it's out there. It's, it's, a it's, you know, we have so much shame and stuff wrapped up in our sexuality to begin with. Um, and then, you know, you throw a chronic illness on top of that. I mean, gosh, like yeah, most, why? most, most married couples struggle with their sex lives without a chronic illness. Exactly. So, and, and but why is it like that? Why, why are we in New England so uptight? Well, I think it's, it's carryover from the, the Puritans. You know, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of programmed shame around our bodies that comes, that has been passed down through the generations, sometimes non-verbally. You know, there's just this, sort of this, and, and then it becomes this cultural norm, and so we don't question it. And, and, and I mean, I think it's pretty ubiquitous in the U.S. in general to have shame around our bodies, but especially I've noticed there's like a, there's a special flavor of it in New England, um, and, I, and I, I believe it's because of that, that Puritan background. You know, we have, it's, it, pleasure is not okay right? Pleasure is sin. Um, and we still have, even though I think I was reading an article a couple of years ago about how like there's fewer churches in the state of Massachusetts than anywhere else. You know, a lot of people, in, um, especially in New England, I think have, have turned away from organized religion because of wounding and things that have occurred. It doesn't mean that the programming isn't still there. Whether or not you, you are actively engaging um, with, with a a religion that's perpetuating that belief structure, it's still in, in there. 
and, um, and needs to be addressed and needs to be looked at. And so, you know, the shame around our bodies is huge. And so any, what I would say to anyone who's listening to this, who, who has sort of piqued their interest around like, wow, maybe if I have a chronic illness, sexuality could be um, a pathway for opening up some energetic healing space. I always recommend starting with yourself with that, because then if you can make a, a healthy relationship with your own body and your own sexuality, you're not then introducing the dynamic of what this other person is thinking about my body into the sexual space, because then we're engaging our minds and then we're, we're immediately taken out of it, right? Anytime we are feeling self-conscious around our bodies, we're not able to be fully present to sex in, in, in what it, what it can be and what it can serve for us. Um, because we're wrapped up in our own, in our own headspace and in our own fears and in our own insecurities. So really taking, taking the time out to explore that with your own body on your own, I think is, is a really powerful pathway to start moving some of that shame and to be willing to look at yourself no matter what state you're in physically and be able to look yourself in the eyes and say, I love you. Um, and to really, to really let yourself feel love for yourself, regardless of what might be happening to your physical body, um, is, is hugely powerful act. Yeah, I think, I think you're, you're very right with that. And, you know, just as in life, we kind of put things in different compartments. Um, I think you've got to, open that compartment up and explore it a little bit more and use that, use that tool of communication with your partners, uh, partner. Sorry. I don't want you to have too many of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, some people roll that way. Too. Yeah, I know. I know. I, uh, that was a slip. I, <laughs> but, but that communication and that asking for permission. And I always, you know, in the role of gynecology, I used to suggest to people to really make it a point to put things away, down, distraction, and have a date night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you like date nights? I love date nights. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, think, so, I think that, uh, yeah, foreplay starts outside of the bedroom, way outside. Yeah. 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 And you just have to be, you have to be receptive. You know, unfortunately, there's so many unhappy marriages. Um, and it's, it's very, it's sad. It saddens me that, you know, it's too easy to walk away uh, than to put any effort into things these, these days. Yeah, I actually just had a, my last interview was with a, a reverend about crafting a really meaningful wedding ceremony so that you have something to anchor into when you get started. Because anyhow, I won't go off on that tangent. I got super passionate about it. People can check out that episode <laughs> <laughs> if they want to hear more about that. Uh, we are coming to the end of our time. I, I want to thank you so much for for being with us uh, here today and and for sharing your story and for sharing your wisdom and um, and for opening up this conversation that we have not had yet on the show. So thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. It's, it's, I come from a unique uh, kind of encompassed background simply because in gynecology, we talk a lot about sex. And then having been sick like that, uh, it just kind of, it comes natural a little bit now that I have that you know, I, I, hindsight's 2020, right? Mm -hmm. So with that 2020 hindsight, before, before we sign off, um, what, what feels like a really important nugget in the realm of, of a sexual relationship that, that maybe you haven't shared yet or, um, or that feels really important to, to emphasize for someone who's dealing with a chronic illness? I guess, I guess asking permission um, to be vulnerable and opening up that, that communication, that line of communication. If it hasn't been opened, then really you have to work hard at trying to open it up. And uh, for anybody that is listening and has someone 
a partner in their life that is ill, you got to give them a little bit of a break. Uh, um, and I think, you know, lessening that stress and doing the subtle things like a nice kiss and a back rub and things like that, just being aware, uh, I think it makes a big difference. Mm, beautiful. And if you're looking for resources on communication, we've done a lot of episodes about healthy communication on this show. So scroll through because there's a lot of, of, I mean, there's so much valuable information. If that's a, if that's an area that you're struggling with, there's a, a lot of amazing people I've talked to and just a wealth of information that has flown forth on this show already. So, um, so thank you, Cindy and, um, and to all of our listeners, thank you so much. And I love you and I'm grateful for your continued support. We wouldn't be what we are without you listening. Uh, if you want to, if you want to play in the superpower realm, come check us out over at superpowerexperts.com. Got a lot of fun stuff going on over there. A lot of ways for you to engage and play with us. Um, and unlock your superpowers and, and discover how you can use them to change the world. So we're, we're having a blast over there. Come, come have it with us. And until next time, go out and love yourself so that you can love the world more deeply. Many blessings. Are you ready to discover your superpowers? Go now to superpowerexperts.com and take the superpower quiz today.